So we are continuing uh, through a, a series that we've been doing on the book of Acts. And this book in the Bible, it contains this ongoing story of God's people detailing what happens, specifically after Jesus is no longer here in the flesh. What happens in this story? How do we get from Jesus is here and all the stuff that happens with he dies and then he rises again, and then how do we get, what's, what happens between all of that and now? Because we're still here these thousands of years later, and we're still talking about Jesus, and we're still worshiping, singing songs about Jesus, and we're still preaching about Jesus. So what, how did this even continue? How did this story really happen? Okay? So God continues to do amazing things because he is living within Jesus' disciples as the Holy Spirit, in, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, if that sounds strange to you, there were probably a lot of people back then who felt the same way. If it sounds amazing to you, there were probably a lot of people who felt that way too. Jesus commanded all of his disciples to go into all the world to make more disciples, and he promised that God the Holy Spirit would come upon them, would fill them, empowering them to speak and do marvelous things right there in Jerusalem and even all the way to the ends of the earth. And this story in the book of Acts is filled with amazing things and powerful speeches full of God's truth, and today's story is one of those stories full of amazing things, God's powerful truth. But the story that we're going to read today is also sad in a way. It's sad and it's horrific. And it's one of those stories that when you read the Bible, it might make you wonder, why did this have to happen? Why is this in the Bible? So especially if you are new to church or if you're new, fairly new to the Bible and you have a lot of questions, I want to say this as we begin today. God speaks to us through the Bible, which we often call the Word of God. And God speaks to us even, and sometimes even more powerfully, through the parts of the Bible that are difficult to understand and that are difficult to accept. God still speaks. And when we're able to get a clear picture of what is the meaning and purpose behind these difficult parts of the Bible, then we can see the powerful truth behind these difficult things. And, and the truth in all of these is that there really is a God who is bigger than even the most horrible, unfair, shocking things that might happen in our lives, and that this God has a plan for this world that cannot be stopped. So we pick up the story today where the apostles have just been arrested and brought to trial with the religious leaders for doing what? For preaching and speaking in the name of Jesus Christ and for healing in the name of Jesus Christ, even though the religious leaders had told them not to. That's why they got in trouble. Because the religious leaders said, stop what you're doing, stop healing and speaking and preaching in the name of Jesus. They didn't stop, so they got in trouble again. And even though these apostles were flogged, which means they were basically beaten for their actions, it says, the Acts uh, chapter uh, 6 says that they left the temple rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace. For the name, capital N, name, the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every other name. They were counted worthy and they felt joy for having been beaten on behalf of this name. And so the story continues into our passages for today. We are going to start with Acts chapter 7. And because I'm reading two chapters of Scripture today, I'm not going to read through every single verse of these two chapters, but I'm going to tell you a summary of the story with actual verses from those passage, passages highlighted for you. Now, if you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, uh, I want you to encourage you to bring that out right now. There, hopefully, there might be some Bibles in the seats in front of you. If they're not, maybe you can borrow from somebody next to you. Um, so you can flip to Acts chapter 6. Acts is toward the end of the Bible. Uh, it's in the New Testament. Um, it's after the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's the fifth book of the New Testament. Okay. And, the, and Acts chapter 6 starts with this verse. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Wait, 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 hold up. Didn't I just tell you that the disciples got beaten for disobeying the religious leaders? They got beaten and they rocked. And then those are just like a few crazy people, right? Those are just like the really delusional crazy people who were like, yeah, we just got beaten. Oh, this is great. We got to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. But it was just those, right? Like, who would ever want to join this movement, this God thing that's happening, where you might actually get beaten for, for obeying God? Like, who would ever want to join that? Well, what it says here is that in those days, when the number, number of disciples was increasing, 
the number of disciples, the number of people who were following the Lord Jesus Christ was increasing. They increased so much, in fact, that you have all these diverse groups of people who are kind of starting to get in each other's way. So in Acts chapter 6, it says they're, they're starting to kind of step on each other's toes. Maybe things are starting to happen. There's tensions rising. Specifically, what it says in chapter 6, uh, six sorry, is that this one group was saying, hey, all of our widows, these needy widows, are not being given food because this other group over here, over here is being served and our widows are not being served. So the leaders agreed, okay, we need to choose seven men. And these are the leaders like the apostles, right? The ones who were sent from Jesus. So Peter and John and these names, these people that walk with Jesus, right? And they said, we need to choose seven men from among you, it says. Choose seven men from among you uh, who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And so they did. They chose these seven people because they said, look, we're the apostles. We need to focus on prayer and preaching, teaching the word, when preaching the word, right? Speaking the word of God. And so, but what, basically what this problem that they were being asked to solve they said it's like basically like waiting tables, right? We're like trying to serve food to these. And not that that's not important, but we are the apostles. Like we're the ones who actually saw Jesus. We got to be out there praying and preaching and teaching. And <coughs> we need people who are full of the spirit and wisdom. Why wisdom? Because you've got all these people saying, hey, what about us? What about me? Hey, them. Hey, us. Blah, blah, blah. Have you ever had that? Like if you have kids or if you have like if you run an organization or if you're a manager of people and they're like, hey, what? Hey, this. Hey, people are complaining. And uh, you need wisdom, right? Otherwise, like if you're a parent and that happens with your kids, you just step in and you're like, everybody shut up. Right? That's not wisdom. It doesn't take any wisdom to do that. You just got to get really mad and just step in there and start like throwing your, your, your mom and dad voice around, right? They need people who are full of the spirit and wisdom to step in there and say, okay, God, what, how do we deal with this? They're not getting enough food because these over here are taking the food. Holy spirit and wisdom, right? Okay, so, and they, they chose this person, one of the men that they chose, one of the people that they chose was named Stephen, right? Um, and so it says, they laid their hands on these men, they prayed for them, and it says, so the word of God spread, continued to spread, right? The word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, it says, increased rapidly, and a large number of even priests became obedient to the faith, priests. Some of these priests might have even originally like opposed what Jesus and his followers were doing. <coughs> Maybe they were torn because some of these higher you know, officials, these temple officials, they were opposing, right? But then you've got this movement happening and they might have felt torn, but they're like, well, how, can we, how can we deny what's happening here? God is doing something here. There's something real to this Jesus. And specifically, we see that Stephen... This man, Stephen, that they talk about, he's really taking his job seriously. He was performing. So, so apparently Stephen was waiting tables, is what they said. He was making sure that everybody was getting what they needed. But it says that, that he was also performing great wonders and signs as he was waiting tables, which was bringing glory to God. It was enriching the hearts of the people that he was serving. So he's not just waiting tables. He's not just doing this, this like menial ministry work, but he's actually doing, performing signs and wonders of God as he's doing it, right? Have you ever said to yourself, like, oh, in my job, I want to glorify God, and I want, I want this job to be more than just a job. I want, I want people to see God shining through me, but then when you actually get to the job, you're like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because I'm, I'm like, caught up with this over here, and I got to do all these paperwork, and I have to do this, this documents, and I have this huge project, and I have to deal with people that are, like, crazy or dumb or both or right I have to I, deal, I have to deal with traffic and I get into work and I'm all mad and how am I going to glorify God with all this well it says Stephen was doing this ministry work of waiting tables and caring for people and he was also performing these signs and wonders and God was being glorified <clears throat> he was really taking this seriously but it wasn't like he was just trying really hard it says that he was full of the Spirit. As we've seen over and over and over again, there are people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, doing what the Holy Spirit is leading them to do, but then there's opposition. There are people who are going to say, no, stop doing what you're doing. But as we saw in our last sermon, the well-respected teacher, Gamaliel, what he said is that when you oppose what God is doing, you're not just opposing the people, you're opposing God himself. And there's no point to that. 
So we have these op opposition, these people who are opposing Stephen and the other apostles. It says, particularly the Jewish uh, religious officials and other Jews did not like what was being said. For some of them, it was that they didn't like that they were being blamed for putting Jesus to death, even though the disciples were saying he was now alive, which I always found kind of interesting because it was like, they're so mad that the disciples are saying that they killed Jesus, but Jesus is alive again, so it's not like they're, they're like saying, okay, Jesus is alive, so you have a chance to turn this around, right? You killed Jesus, but he's alive, but they're mad because they're saying that they killed Jesus. If they would only understand that Jesus was actually alive, and Jesus was actually able to forgive them for whatever it is that they did, and they would just own up to the fact that, yeah, we did hate Jesus, and we, did, we are responsible for him being crucified, but we can be forgiven. We can have a new life. So some people were like angry that they were saying, you crucified, you crucified. For some of them, they actually just didn't even agree with this idea that someone could be raised from the dead. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. For some of them, it felt as though these Christians were trying to destroy the religious, the, the Jewish religion and the customs. And so you had these different people who were like, no, stop, stop, stop. In Stephen's case, they started spreading lies about him, and he was brought under tri trial to the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin. And so he was asked... So these lies were being spread about him, that he's, he's going to destroy the temple and all this. And the, so the, the Jewish ruling council says, is this true? Are these charges true at the beginning of chapter 7? Are these charges true? Now, these are the highest religious officials in this temple. They don't like this. Okay? And so, so Stephen goes off on this long sermon slash history lesson on how God brought his plan to be, how it started with Abraham, and he promised Abraham that he was going to multiply his descendants, and then it goes to Moses, who rescued, who God used to rescue the people of Egypt from slavery, or the people of Israel from slavery in, in Egypt, right? And so he goes through this whole unfolding plan, right? And then he talks about how, how Jesus came, and how, uh, how God does not live in this physical temple, Maybe that's what he was saying, and that's why the people said, oh, see, he said he's going to destroy the temple. What he was saying was that this physical temple is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that God, the Holy Spirit, can live inside of you, that we are the temple. And so some of the people who were saying, no, 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 you're messing up our Jewish religion and our customs and our traditions, they were probably saying, well, what about the temple? The temple's the most important thing. And Stephen's saying, no, no, we are the temple. God lives within us. So then these people probably started saying, oh, you don't care about the temple. You're going to destroy the temple and spreading all these lies. That's how rumors start, right? Somebody says something, somebody else takes it out of context or they don't quite understand what's being said. And then before you know it, somebody's in trouble for really nothing true. So Stephen is on trial and he's talking about and he... And he says this thing at the end of his, his sermon speech, right? He says, the most high doesn't live in, in houses made by human hands, right? And he says to these Jewish officials, he says, you stiff-necked people at the, end of, uh, at the end of chapter 7. He says, you stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He's talking to the Jewish officials, telling them you resist the Holy Spirit. That's pretty bold speaking. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, capital R, capital O, righteous one, Jesus Christ, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. There he goes again saying they were responsible for killing Jesus. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. These were the religious officials. These were the highest, most regarded people, and he's telling them you have not obeyed the law. That was a big deal for them, because the law was like, that was everything for them. That They were the teachers of the law. They were the ones who upheld the law. They were the ones who were supposed to have known the law better than anyone else. And here's Stephen telling them, you're not even obeying the law. Whoa. Stephen, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yes, he is. Let's read what happens to Stephen at the end of chapter 7. We're just going to read through this part. At the end of chapter 7, oops, it says 5. It's supposed to be 7. This is what it says. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, 
They were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man, Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. And at this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, very important character that we are going to learn more about starting in the next couple of weeks. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. What a horrible ending to somebody who was speaking the words of God to people who didn't want to hear it. Did they have to kill him? Did it have to happen this way? Couldn't God have stepped in and done something about this? Remember, this is a continuing story. And we're going to see this as this story continues, how God takes even the horrible, tragic things that happen, and he uses even those things to work out his plan for the world. And yes, this is horrible. If this were to happen to any one of us in this church where there was some like religious council that didn't like what you were saying and they dragged you out in the parking lot over there and they threw stones at you until you died, that would be horrible. I guarantee you some of us would be crying. We'd be sick to our stomachs. That would be horrible. Can you imagine this? That would be horrible. And yes, these people were faithful to God and they knew that God was doing something bigger. But I bet even the apostles were like, oh my God, oh no, this is horrible. This guy's dead. Awful. So I don't want you to get this idea that these people were like so holy that Stephen was dragged out and huge stones were thrown at him until he died and he's laying there bleeding on the ground. And the the apostles were just like, well, God's going to work this out. God has a plan. I'm sure this happened for a reason. I think the apostles probably had to take a minute. Whoa. Yes, we were rejoicing because we were counted worthy of suffering for the name. Okay, God. I want to encourage you um, to keep coming back and and hearing these uh, messages that we have over the next few weeks because as I said, the story is unfolding. And so even from what you hear today, it's going to get bigger. The the story is going to keep unfolding. How is God going to take this, the murder of one of Jesus' followers, this faithful person, how is God going to take this and do something with it? Even this. But let's talk about Stephen. That's a really great picture, right? This image of this man who's smiling as he sees the glory of God with blood streaming down his face. Um, I've seen some Bible movies where Stephen is portrayed as like this like boyish faced man. Because it says, it says that his face, he had like the face of an angel, right? And so it's like, I think the movies try to portray him as like this angelic face, like this little baby. You know the little baby angels that are like sleeping on the clouds or whatever? <laughs> I think like sometimes the Bible movie makers try to find this guy who looks like that, right? But he probably had a beard. It, it was probably a dark beard. He probably didn't have blue eyes. Probably had like, I don't know. He's probably looked probably more like this, right? Stephen, okay? There is nothing really special about Stephen, and yet there is something very special about Stephen. There isn't really anything special about Stephen because Stephen was a normal guy. He was a normal person. Stephen was chosen to take on a menial job so the apostles could focus on preaching the word and on prayer. And yet, we are told multiple times in these chapters that there is something special about Stephen. What is it? Chapter 6, verse 5 says that Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 8 says Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Chapter 6, verse 15 says they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Chapter 7, verse 55 says that, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, the funny thing is, is that all of these apostles and disciples were just normal people. They were all normal people, even the apostles who had been with Jesus and now had been sent to make more disciples of Jesus. Peter, John, all of them, they were just normal people, and yet they weren't just normal people because they were people who were filled with the Holy Spirit, with the very presence and power and love and wisdom of God. They were normal, but God made them anything but normal. Wouldn't you like to be normal but not normal, just like Stephen? I mean, of course, we probably wouldn't jump at the chance to get pounded with big rocks until we are dead. But to live, to live and even die with that kind of power, with that kind of confidence and boldness, with that kind of love for God, with that kind of desire for people to know him, don't you want that, Christian? I do. So what was it that the Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to do? Well, the Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to be humble. <clears throat> we are not told what Stephen's credentials are. We don't know what his special skills were. But when the need arose for people, men who were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, to wait tables, Stephen was chosen. And Stephen was ready. Did you know that the Holy Spirit can enable you to be humble? How many of you find it easy to be humble? Especially when you know you are right. Especially when you know that your education and your skill and your experience merits more than what you are being given. How many of you find it easy to be humble? I don't. The Holy Spirit enables us to be humble. For some of us whose hearts, and we know, you know, you know if this is you, if your heart is filled with pride and even self-righteousness sometimes, you know that maybe the greatest miracle for you is that the Holy Spirit will enable you to be humble, as Jesus was humble. The Holy Spirit enables Stephen to perform signs and wonders. Stephen shows us that when you are full of the Spirit, it doesn't matter what your job is. You want people to know that God is for real and that Jesus is alive and that the Holy Spirit has come and by the way, when it says that Stephen performed signs and wonders, he's not talking about like card tricks and making himself levitate for no reason, okay? It's not, this is not just pointless things like, ooh, look what I can do. Oh, I can guess the card you have in your hand. And now it's in your pocket. Now it's in this pocket. That's not what he's doing. He's, he's doing things that Jesus did. The Holy Spirit enabled God's people to do the things that Jesus did. Heal the sick, cast out demons, speak with truth, and authority to prophesy. And when people saw these things, they think, whoa, there's, there's something to this God. And Stephen is doing all this, apparently, as he's waiting tables. So the Holy Spirit enables him to do these signs and wonders. The Holy Spirit enables Stephen to speak with wisdom that his opposers could not stand up to. When Stephen is faced with opposition from other religious people, he answers them with wisdom from the Holy Spirit while they are the, they are the ones, it says, they are trying to argue with him. He just answers them with wisdom in the Holy Spirit. Have you ever had someone try to pick a fight with you? Try to argue with you? Try to get a rise out of you? Try to, try to really get you riled up? Do you know that the Holy Spirit can enable you to respond with wisdom instead of responding out of anger? Instead of responding in kind and saying, all right, fine, you want to pick a fight? Let's go. Let's go. Let's throw it out right here. Come on. Did you know that the Holy Spirit can enable you to do that? Even when you know that you have done nothing wrong, the Holy Spirit enables you to do that. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to have the face of an angel while the religious authorities were looking, in, it says that they were looking intently at him. You know what I imagine is they're all like gathered around Stephen and Stephen's like, <laughs> face of an angel, right? Just like glowing. And they're looking in, right? Just imagine this. All these people are standing around him looking intently at him. And he's like this. They're like this. You know, just like shaking with fury. And he's like this face of an angel while they were looking intently at him. Awkward, right? You could be like, stop looking intently at me. Ah, you're making me feel weird. If all you were doing is performing signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then people started arguing with you, but you were too wise, so they started lying about you, and now you're in trouble, 
for doing nothing wrong, now you're in trouble. What kind of face do you have? What kind of face do you have when you get in trouble for doing nothing wrong? When somebody's mad at you for doing nothing wrong? When somebody's mad at you but it's not even your fault, what kind of face do you have? I know what kind of face I would have. <laughs> All the faces that we could possibly have. Face of an angel? That's, that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do in us. That's something that the Holy Spirit enabled in Stephen. Without the Holy Spirit empowering us, what kind of face would any of us have in that situation? Do you like getting, having people argue with you unfairly? Do you like being lied about? Do you like getting in trouble for doing nothing wrong? Not me neither. And yet here is Stephen with the face of an angel while he is going through all of this. The Holy Spirit enables Stephen to look up to heaven and see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It's one thing to want to see the glory of God, but to look up in the middle of the situation that he's in and see this glorious scene, that has to be the Holy Spirit. That's the revelation, the revealing of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So the Holy Spirit had also enabled Stephen to have a pure heart. A heart that was pure so that he could look up in the middle of the situation and see the glory of God. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to pray even while he was being stoned to death. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to pray, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I mean, come on. Who is this guy? Remember, just a normal guy. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Really, simply, this is what it comes down to. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to look and live and speak and love and forgive just like Jesus. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to be like Jesus. Who does that sound like as he's being murdered? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They do not know what they're doing. That's Jesus. That sounds like Jesus. Now, just for a minute, just for a minute, forget about all the what ifs and the doubts and the skepticism and the jadedness that you might have. Forget about your busyness or your stress, your worries, your problems. Forget about all that just for just a minute and ask yourself, wouldn't I love a faith like this? Wouldn't I love a confidence and a boldness and a peace like this? Wouldn't I love to have passion and love, a clear vision? Wouldn't I love to have forgiveness like this? Would you? I would. I do. Now, at this point, each of us here has a decision to make. We have some decisions to make. Is this for real? Is this for real? Or is it not? Is this kind of life, this Holy Spirit empowered, beyond our own capability kind of life, is this thing for real? Is this for real? Is it possible? And if it is real, do I really want it? If it is real, maybe the bigger question is, why wouldn't I want this? Why wouldn't I want this kind of life? Why would I not want my life to look like Jesus? Even in the midst of the harshest persecution and trial, why would I not want my life to look like this? Now, some of us might be here today, you're around church, you may even participate and help with church stuff. You may have grown up around church. Shoot, maybe you're even a pastor's kid or a missionary's kid or some kind of kid. But honestly, you don't believe any of this when you're being honest with yourself. You don't believe any of this. Some of us have been around church for so long, we can claim a faith that goes back years or even decades, but this kind of life, this kind of faith, this kind of spirit-filled power, it's not really a reality for you. Or if it is, it's been a long time since you could say that you've lived that life. Some of us are caught in patterns or addictions that when we're being really honest with ourselves, we know they are keeping us from fully embracing all that God wants us to have, all he wants to give us. For those of us in this situation, it's like, it's like we can't let go of that tiny pebble in order to embrace the vast treasure that we can find in Jesus. I mean, look at what it says that Stephen sees when he looks up into heaven. He said, the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, the, the religious leaders, they couldn't take this. 
They couldn't take his insistence that Jesus is equal to at the right hand of God in all of God's glory. Now, Stephen doesn't seem to be delusional. He doesn't seem to be drunk or high. He, he hadn't been hit on the head with rocks yet, so he wasn't like seeing stars and birds flying around his head. He's not seeing things. He's not hallucinating. In fact, he seems to be very clear-headed, answering the opposition, explaining hundreds of years of history and lots of theology, and he sees this picture of the glory of God. What do you do with that? Now, if he was just making this up, or something else was happening, then just write this story off. Just write it off. Forget it. This is not real. This is fairy tales. There's plenty of people who believe that. Just fairy tales. Snow White, Peter Pan, Bugs Bunny, Jesus, it's all the same. It's just fairy tales. There's plenty of people who, who believe that. But if he really did see the glory of God, if he really saw the glory of God, and no one was supposed to see the glory of God, by the way, and Jesus standing at his right hand, what does that say about this God? And what do you do with that? If this is for real, what do you do with it? What do you do with this vision that, that Stephen has? Here is the great unmatched glory of God, and here is Jesus at God's right hand, meaning that Jesus is worthy to be there, and that Jesus is God. And this Jesus said, follow him, and he would teach us to make disciples, and that God the Holy Spirit would fill us and enable us to do the very things that Jesus himself did, even greater things than these, Jesus said. If this God is for real, and Stephen sees this God, and many of us can point to proof in our lives that, that this God is for real for ourselves, then what do we do with that? How would this impact the way that you live, the kind of person you choose to be, the choices that you make to do or not to do? How would this impact the way that you treat your kids, the way that you talk to your spouse, the way you do your work, your job? Oh, come on. Stephen didn't have a screaming child on his lap, throwing food, causing a scene in the middle of a restaurant. How could he know what that's like? Of course he had the face of an angel. I, Stephen didn't have you know, this pressure of huge deadlines and enormous projects looming over him at work like I do. Of course his face looked like an angel. Come on. Stephen didn't get it. Stephen didn't have to live with my spouse. Because if he did, he would know the frustration that I live with. Maybe he wouldn't be so forgiving. Oh, God, forgive them for what they've done. Stephen didn't have to deal with the confusion and the temptation and just the circus of being in high school or at this stage of life where I'm at. Stephen's heart wouldn't be so pure if he went to my school. They were throwing rocks at his head to kill him. I know Stephen didn't have to deal with the things that you and I and everyone around the world has to deal with, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he responded with grace even when those stones were being hurled at him. Is there something real about this guy or not? Speaking of stones, I want to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we, when we say stones, stones are being thrown at him, because you might get an, a, an idea that it's just these little rocks, right? Stones. You know, it's kind of either if you're, if you're super strong and buff, you look cool picking one of these up, or if you're not like me, then you just look dumb. But I, I want to give you an idea of the kind of stones that we're talking about. We're not just talking about little pebbles, stones. Now, none of us has to deal with persecution here in America like they do in other parts of the world where their lives are under threat of harm or even death. None of us has to do with things like that. It's not a reality for us. We're just expressing our faith in Jesus Christ. But I want to give you an idea of what this stone might have looked like that they would have used to stone Stephen. People like to say, oh, that place is really close. It's just a stone's throw away. Like this kind of stone, really? How far can you throw this stone? Pretty big stone. How can I be filled with the Holy Spirit and follow Jesus and see the glory of God when I have this big stone in my life? See, maybe you can't relate to stones being thrown at your head because of what you believe. But we can all relate to having stones in our lives that seem too big to overcome. A stone. How can I respond? How can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? How can I do the things that Jesus did when I've got this big stone? And it's killing me. Or it feels like it is.
What is it for you? What is your big stone? Insurmountable health issues, marital problems, kid problems, <clears throat> troubles with your job, troubles because you don't have a job, facing deep wounds from your past, confusion, doubts, fears, anxiety, depression, addiction, exhaustion. Didn't you know that we were made to overcome those by the blood of Jesus Christ? Didn't you know that the Holy Spirit works powerfully in us in spite of, and yes, even sometimes because of those stones in our lives? Imagine you were in this situation and you're facing this trial. But it's hard for us to imagine that, isn't it? Because we haven't been in this situation, but I know, I guarantee you that many of you here have faced your own insurmountable, impossible trial. What do you do? Is this God for real or is he not? Is this God able to help you, to fill you, to persevere through these trials or not? Is God able to show you his glory in the midst of the horrible things that you may be going through or not? It reminds me that Jesus had a big stone in his way too. And he was crucified for the sin of you and me and for everyone. And he was laid in a tomb. And to seal him in that tomb, they placed in front of the opening a big stone, rock. But as we see in this story, nothing could hold Jesus down. Nothing could hold him back. Jesus would not be defeated. And Jesus rose so that we would know that if we are in him, if we walk with him, if we put our trust in him, then nothing, not even the big stones in our life, need to defeat us either. But it's so hard to remember that, isn't it? It's so hard to see that victorious, spirit-filled life become a reality. You know what I realized? In this story of these first Christians through whom God started his church, so many of the miracles, so much of the power came when or after they did this one thing or they were being faithful to this one thing. It says after Jesus ascended to heaven and they were waiting for what would happen next, when they needed to choose a new apostle, when the number of believers started to increase, as they were going to the temple just before they healed the lame beggar, after Peter and John were released from prison, when they had chosen the seven men to help with the food distribution, they were engaged in intense and faithful prayer. Prayer, connecting with God. In these difficult moments, this is where they encountered the Holy Spirit and power. This is where it happened. It's prayer. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they did it together. And it doesn't talk about how some of the more vocal apostles were praying and the other ones who just kind of stood there awkwardly waiting for them to be done praying. Everyone prayed. And that's the impression that I get, right? Go back and read it for yourself. Tell me if you see something different, right? For many of us, whether we pray or not, I think our idea of prayer is, even if we know this is not what it's supposed to be, it's our way to ask God for things that we want. They could be good things, requests that are completely justifiable, right? But that's pretty much all that prayer is to many of us. I fall into this as well. If I have time to pray, I'm just going to spend time praying for the things that I want and the things that I need. But the story we read today shows us a different picture of prayer. Rather than just being a wish list or a complaining session, again, we need to be able to bring our request to God. We need to be able to complain to God. But prayer is more than that. Instead of prayer just being that, there is something more. What if the life and the death of Stephen is a picture of how God is calling us to engage with him, to pray, to connect with him today? That prayer is meant to be this. What if prayer could be this? Looking to Jesus no matter what we are going through. What if that was our concept of prayer? That we are looking to Jesus no matter what we are going through. What did Stephen do when he was about to be killed with these giant stones thrown at his head? What did Stephen do? He looked up and he saw Jesus. That enabled him, while he was being killed, to say, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. That enabled him to have that face that reflected the glory of God. That is what enabled him to respond the way that he did was because he looked up, he saw Jesus, 
He saw God in his glory. What if you could experience this Holy Spirit empowered life? And it came by faithfully, 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 every time we go through the trials, every time we face the stones, every time the stones are coming at us, we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus. Even when it's hard, we look to Jesus. Even when nobody else wants to pray with you, you look to Jesus. Even when you, you have an argument with your spouse and like, let's pray, and your spouse is like, forget it, I don't want to pray with you right now. You look to Jesus. Even when you feel alone in your faith, in your workplace, and you're like the only one who's trying to be faithful to God, and the only one who's trying, look to Jesus. When it seems like there's no way out, there's no hope, it seems like there's not, nothing's going to change, you look to Jesus. Even when you failed for the millionth time, and you realize you, you're not measuring up to what God wants you to do, but you say, God, give me another shot, Lord. I want to honor you. I want to follow you. You look to Jesus. What if this is how we experienced the glory of God? Because I believe that it is. I believe that's what we see in this story. Notice Stephen prays right before he dies. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit because he knows he's about to die. Notice how Stephen still recognizes that something is being done to him. He's not immune to what's happening around him. It's not like the rocks are just bouncing off his head and he's just there. Notice how Stephen still dies. See, prayer is not just a wish list. It's not just a way to try to get out of the problems we face. Remember back in chapter 4 when Peter and John got in trouble for the first time they came back to the community of Christians and they didn't pray that God would get rid of these bad people. They didn't pray that the problems would go away, that things would get easy for them. What did they pray for? They prayed for more boldness so that more and more people would know the name and the power and the love and the salvation of Jesus Christ. That is what they prayed for. What if we prayed like that in the midst of the trials that we are facing? Instead of saying, God, take the bad people away. God, take the bad feelings away. God, take the bad events away. God, make things easy for me again. What if we prayed like this? What if we looked up and we saw Jesus and we said, Jesus, how can I stop living for you in the midst of what I'm going through? But it's hard, and I can't always do it, so God, make me, bold. make me more bold. Give me more boldness. Give me more strength to live for you. And there, as he was about to be killed, Stephen sees the glory of God and Jesus at God's right hand, and his reaction is, Lord, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. How could he do that? He was looking at Jesus. So as he was looking at Jesus, our question should be, how could he not do that? Seeing the glory of God right in front of him. All he could say was, God, you're bigger than this. You're bigger than what's about to happen to me. You are God glorified. So God, be glorified in me. Don't hold the sin against them. Receive my spirit. Here I come, Jesus. I'm about to meet you. Do what you're going to do through this, God. The reason he could do that was because he was looking to Jesus. It wasn't something he thought of while he was being killed. You know, like, oh, Jesus, I never really looked to you. But right now, okay, I'm going to look to you. This is a way of life. It's who he was. It's how he approached God. Maybe when he prayed, he didn't look up and see a vision of God every single time. But he sure knew this God was real. And his life reflected it. And no matter how many rocks he had coming at him, nothing was more real to him in that moment than the glory of God and Jesus standing right there at God's right hand and the Holy Spirit living within him. How about us? When we go through what we go through, can we look to Jesus? I ask you today, church, if you see the glory of God, if you know that God is glorified, high and lifted up, I ask you, church, how can we not look to Jesus? This has to make a difference for us. It has to make a difference for me. And I say this knowing that I'm going to go home and my kids are going to annoy me and my wife and I are going to get into a thing and I'm going to have to deal with bills and I'm going to have to you know, call this thing to deal with the thing that they messed up my bill. I'm going to have to deal with all the stuff of life. I have to go back to deal with work. I have to deal with my plumbing's backed up. I have to deal with all the stuff. You know, just life. God has to be bigger than this. God is bigger than this. God is glorified and God is calling us. Look to Jesus in the midst of what you are going through. Did you know this life is available to you today? Whether you've already believed, whether you've never believed, whether you have once believed and you've drifted away, maybe you ran away, you can experience this new life in God today through Jesus Christ. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can look to Jesus today. So I want to pray with you as we close.
I'm going to pray with you as we close. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. Now, I want to pray with you as we close. I want to pray first for those who, who have believed in Jesus Christ. You already believe in Jesus Christ. You've already put your faith in him. But today you needed to be reminded to look to Jesus. Yes, those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ still need to be reminded to look to Jesus. So if God has pulled his tug on your heart this morning to remind you to look to him again, if your eyes have drifted, if your heart has drifted away, if it's been longer than you can remember before you have looked to Jesus like this, to say, God, no matter what, you are more than what I'm going through. You are more than the stones that are being thrown at me. You are more than the ways that the enemy is trying to tear me down. You are more. You are more than this. You are bigger than this. You are able. You are glorified. You are high and lifted up. Jesus, I put my trust in you. So, Lord, I pray with, I pray for those of our family of God today, Lord God, who need to be reminded of this today. That looking to Jesus, who is glorified, high and lifted up, that has to make a difference in our lives. Lord God, you are real. There's no if. God, you are real. What Stephen saw, the glory of God opening up in heaven, that's real. It's bigger than the, the, the most vast amounts of money that we could ever accumulate. It's bigger than, than the, 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 mo the highest degree that we could ever attain. It's bigger than the, the, the most prestigious job that we could ever get. It's bigger than the, the highest achievement that we, could ever, that we could ever get. God, it's bigger than anything. The glory of God, the one who placed the stars in the sky, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the one who made us. The one who was and who is and whoever more shall be. The glory of God. Lord, for those of us who have believed you, God, remind us today again, how could we forget? How could we forget how great you are? How could we forget your goodness? How could we forget your majesty? You are high and lifted up, Lord. And so we turn our eyes to you again. We look to you, Jesus. We look to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We look to you once again. And as we continue looking at you, God, as we continue fixing our eyes on Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, as we continue to fix our gaze on you, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may reflect the glory of God on our faces, in our lives, in our words, in our actions, the choices that we make, even the things that we do when no one else is looking. May we reflect you, God. And now I want to pray with those of you who have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, but something today tells you there is something to this Jesus Christ. There is something here. You can do that right now in your own heart, in your own words. Say, Jesus, I want to look to you. I want to see you. I want, to look like, I want my life to look like you. I want my life to reflect your glory. Even if you still have so many questions and doubts, fears and worries and skepticism, let God speak to you to look to him today. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for our friends that are here today, Lord God, who do not, have not put their trust in you yet. Lord, that they would see that there is something real to this God, that either Stephen was lying, delusional, or there's something real. And that if there's something real to this God, then, then we need to take notice. That doesn't mean there's not going to be questions and fears and doubts, but that means we need to take notice. We need to do something with this revelation of God high and lifted up. So Lord, lead each person in this place who has never trusted you, Lord, to have that 
conversation with you in their own heart to say, God, I want to trust you. I want to know you. I want my life to be filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever that looks like, whatever it takes, God. Bring us to the end of ourselves, God. Help us to realize that these stones that are coming at us, they are too much, they are too big. Our life will not reflect the glory of God without you. And our life will not become what you have made it to be without you. So Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your death and resurrection, would you save each one of us today, God, as you have already, God. May we experience your salvation this day, God. May we experience the joy and the freedom of knowing you and what you have done for us on the cross, God, that you have given your life for us, that we need no longer be slaves to sin, that our lives can actually reflect the holiness, the glory of God. Draw us close to you this day, God. Let's all stand and sing together.